As a nation, the British have a love affair with Spain. 12 million people a year come to worship its sun-kissed shores. In this series, I want to find out what fascinates us about this country and if there is more to Spain than meets the eye. I'm amazed. I had absolutely no idea that this was here. This will be a journey of discovery for me. I did not expect this. Wow. As I crisscross the country, longing to know more about it. Seeing its world famous landmarks up close. Awesome. Awesome. This is one of the places that everyone should see before they die. And uncovering lesser known sites. You do literally feel transported. As I experience this incredibly vibrant culture. It's pretty mad, isn't it? I think it's just one of those moments I'm never going to forget the whole of my life. <laughs> There's nothing like this anywhere in the world. I've journeyed south from Barcelona and reached the east coast, for me, the least traveled part of Spain. Here, I'll make my way along the White Shores, or as we know it, the Costa Blanca, ending at a little known island off the Mediterranean coast. I'll take in expat favorite Benidorm along the way, but my starting point is one of Spain's bolder cities. Valencia and I love any city by the sea. It's so special to have everything a city can offer and all this too. The British visit this old port city more than any other nation, its glorious beaches being the main draw. But for some reason the beach alone has never been enough to entice me here. It is strange, because I've travelled quite a lot in Spain, and Valencia is the third largest city in this country, and yet I know nothing about it. Now I get to remedy that. I'm starting on the outskirts of the city, an area called La Huerta, which is a ribbon of agricultural land. Many visitors to Valencia are surprised to discover this verdant lair exists. It's astonishing that there's so much of this green, fertile land so close to the city. This is what Valencia's wealth was built on, all the olive oil it produces, all the oranges, the raisins, all from this area here. But La Huerta has given the world much more than its produce, because here is where Spain's greatest known dish originates, paella. You can't come to the region without indulging in this dish at least once, and I'm about to experience it in the most authentic way. I didn't realise that traditionally it is eaten in the open air over a proper wood fire. Makes it much sexier. Paella was a dish eaten by farmers and labourers for lunch, using rice and whatever else was to hand in the fields. Nandi has lived and worked in La Huerta most of his life. Forty years on from cooking his first paella, he's perfected it. Do you want to cook? Yes. Yes? Thank you. All right. Perfecto. Mm. 
I'm told there's much to learn about cooking this the correct way. So, when you talk about a paella, you're actually talking about a paella pan. So this is what makes the dish. ¿Qué carne? La carne es eh, pollo. Yeah, chicken. Chicken of de corral, de granja. Yeah. Rabbit. Eh, rabbit, conejo. Yeah. Y tres trocitos de pato, duck. Ooh. So this, as it's a special occasion, so he's adding in some duck. Do you mix seafood and meat? Pescado y carne? Uh, junto, together? Sí. No. 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 Sorry. Seafood paellas are fine, but then you just do seafood, or you just do meat. Never the twain. Never the twain shall meet. And it's not the only rule to be strictly abided by. You don't put in chorizo. No. It's a crime. It's a crime, <laughs> it's a crime against cuisine. In uh, Spanish, you can make the paella con lo que quieras. Yes, with whatever. You can make a paella with whatever you like, but you cannot then call it an authentic paella. No. Y no es paella valenciana. And no especially Valencia. not a Valencian paella. Okay. This yeah, is I'm clear. Okay, okay, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> no chorizo. Never, no, never again. Again, again. Never, I promise, I swear. <laughs> Next come the vegetables. Always an assortment of green beans and tomatoes and then whatever you can find growing in the region. Like these, my favorite, the last artichokes of the season. All of this produce couldn't be fresher. It's been picked from the garden this morning. It's gonna taste amazing. It looks delicious already, doesn't it? I mean, this is very skilled. Apart from anything else, I've never managed to build a fire that's burnt that long. I mean, it's going to make me look at paella very differently again. It's a long, involved process. And in this heat, it's thirsty work. So this was traditionally used by farmers. Um, it's Because it's clay, it keeps the water cold. They'd keep it in the, in the shade so that they could have a cool drink whenever they needed one. Si te mojas, refresca. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm going to make your <laughs> <laughs> Oh, very nice. <laughs> ah, very nice. Yeah, I, I think I'd prefer it if it was white wine. <laughs> Nandi may be a pro at cooking this, but he tells me this wasn't always the case. His first ever paella was completely inedible. Why? Why inedible? The rice is very complicated. <laughs> the, point, the point of rice is to go more complicated. Yeah, so because try it. I think this is something that people in, in England don't understand. The paella is about the rice, not about the, the, the ingredients that go into mm -hmm. it, but the main thing is the rice. The rice. The important ingredient, no? Sí. Okay. okay. It's a concept that's unique to the Spanish and Italians, in fact. Anywhere else in the world, the rice accompanies the dish. But here, it's the focal point. He just separated out the vegetables, the ingredients, from the liquid so that there's room for the rice to absorb. Y ahora repartimos. And then you can then you stir it in. Now everything is perfect. You don't have to touch it anymore. You can just leave it. There may seem a lot of rules to cooking the paella, but the Valencians are fiercely protective of this dish. And over the years, the recipe has been altered by different cultures beyond recognition. Guillermo Navarro is the co-founder of Wikipaella, a Valencian organization whose business it is to police the tradition of the paella. Why did you start being interested in paella? For us, paella is, is maybe one of the, one of the cultural elements of our identity as a, as a people. When we were in Madrid or in Barcelona or in New York or in London, and we find paella that contains the product that we don't have here, like chorizo, avocado, and it's like, this is not paella. This is not our tradition. This is not the things that we can find in, in the field. It's about our, our culture, our roots. 
So Nandi said to me that you can put anything you like into mm. a rice dish, but then you can't call it paella, and it's just rice with things. Yeah, the rice with things. <laughs> the rice with I things love is. That. Yeah, the rice with things is one of the best concepts. Is to say. <laughs> no, just tuck anything. Yeah, I'm in. cook. I'm cooking paella. Well, it's rice with things. Yeah. If I put coke with your tea uh, at tea time in, in London. Very short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. It's yeah. like that. Okay, I get it. Another interesting thing in paella is the, the ritual around the paella with your friends. It's more than a cooking, it's just to spend your day cooking a paella. The thing is, if you can arrive to, the, to dinner with your alcohol level, stable. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah, is the easy. It's, it's, tri it's easy. tricky. <laughs> yeah. I can see that. After half an hour simmering, the rice has absorbed the water and all the flavours and is ready to be served. Can't wait to try this. Where's the wine? Yeah. Definitely. Buen vino. Okay. Yay. I mean, this is like my perfect, perfect <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> That's me done that. Mira, hubiera podido traer cava también. Fernando. Really good. Nani, Un aplauso para. Thank you, thank you so much. This is how I told you before. This is the traditional thing, the traditional way to eat paella with your friends, with your family, after the convoy, after cooking everything together, everybody together. And let's try. Outdoor. Perfect. Perfect, yeah. Bon profit. Bon profit. Cheers. 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 It's easy to see how the traditional paella has become lost in translation in certain parts of the world, making it all the more satisfying to experience the real thing whilst in Valencia. I enjoyed the whole experience because I'm absolutely blown away by the passion that these Valencians have for this, this dish, how knowledgeable they are how absolutist they are. There is just no varying from the traditional Valencian way. It's their way or the highway. This region has already enthralled me, and all before I've even ventured into the heart of the city of Valencia. I'm in Valencia in eastern Spain. I ventured from the green outer edges into the heart of the historic city. Many visitors barely leave Valencia's beaches, but those who can drag themselves from their sunbeds will discover all the vibrance of a true Mediterranean city. Among the labyrinth of streets and squares that make up the old town, you'll find cafes like this one. Known as horchaterias, they are a welcome sanctuary from the stifling summer heat. But if you want to behave like a true Valencian, start your day here and don't expect coffee. I am here at one of the most famous horcheterias in Valencia. I couldn't come to the city without trying their local drink, which is made from chufa, tiger nuts. It is one of the specialities of the region. It's served throughout Spain, but it was actually invented here. Always eager to try local delicacy. <laughs> a sweet tale lies behind the milky drink horchata. The story goes that a, that a visiting king of Aragon and Catalonia came to the city and was offered a glass of milk by a little girl. Thank you. Thank you. The king is supposed to have replied, excess horchata, i.e. this isn't milk, this is gold, darling. Horchata is said to have plenty of health benefits, aiding digestion and helping energize. But you have to have a sweet tooth, let me tell you. Might be an acquired taste. <laughs> mm. It is so sweet. Apparently, what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to dip a fanton into it and eat it like that, in for a penny. <laughs> a little would go a long way with me, is all I can say. Mm. 
you need the energy to explore this great city. And a guide helps too. I've been given a tip-off that someone who really knows Valencia also happens to be the curator of a weird and wonderful museum. Tucked away within a Gothic palace on the bar-lined street Calle Caballero, historian Alejandro claims to have the world's largest collection of tin figurines. Over one million tiny pieces are contained within these walls. It's astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing. And its historical scenes have fascinated young, old, and even the most jaded museum goers. I like the bird seller, mm -hmm. the fishmonger. Yes. I love this. Some of them are very rare. We have some, some pieces here that uh, belong to Napoleon, and he offered them to his son. My god. This is an interest verging on an obsession, I would say. <laughs> yes, <laughs> is that fair enough? Well, I think it's a new media. It's a new way to teach history. It's an amazing work you've done. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Ah, it's astonishing. This is quite an extraordinary sight worth seeing, but it's by no means the biggest surprise hidden within the city. For that, Alejandro tells me you have to visit the historic cathedral. So this is the Christian cathedral that was made on the 13th century. So it's got quite a history, this one. It's lovely, beautiful. But what many don't know is what lies inside. For in a small room, just to the side of the cathedral, is the most sought-after relic of them all, the Holy Grail. So this is it. Holy the grail. one true grail. It's Valencia's best kept secret. The fact that the chapel is virtually empty shows just how little known this is. I'm amazed. You know, I'm a Roman Catholic and I had absolutely no idea that this was here. This is the chalice believed to have been used by Jesus Christ at the Last Supper. The quest to find it has long been the subject of religion, fiction and film, but the Vatican claims this to be the real deal. The King of Aragon bought it here in the 14th century. He owed the cathedral money and this was deemed sufficient to cover his debts. I mean, honestly, I, I, can't, I cannot <laughs> believe that I didn't know that this... I mean, I, I thought you were joking when you said that there was a... The Chalice of the Last Supper, yes, the Holy Grail, as they call it. Yes, it's so important uh, as, uh, as a relic. Is it ever used in any services? It has been used in services, but only when the popes have come. But once it was used and it fell down. <gasps> And it breaks a little bit. We cannot see it. This one died three days later. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Whatever your belief, there is something captivating about being in its presence. Valencia is a city that has succeeded in merging the old with the new. While there is a wealth of history here, the skyline is also dominated by some eye-catching buildings. Just a hop, skip and a jump away is this, the amazing city of arts and sciences. And it's a testament to modern architecture. This futuristic vision of steel, glass and greenery is Europe's largest cultural centre. The dazzling complex of attractions was the work of local architect Santiago Calatrava, and it's built on what was once a flood-prone riverbed. The 
the reinvention has been decades in the making and controversially cost the city 1.3 billion euros. But it has catapulted Valencia into Spain's top five tourist destinations. Here in Spain, they have a very forward-thinking view and they have no fear about altering the landscape with this modern architecture, and I love it. Wandering around this city has made me question why I left it so long to visit. For the most astonishing day, Valencia has surprised me from beginning to end. I knew about the beach, but I had no idea that I could go from that wild modern architecture to this gothic baroque surroundings. But Valencia has one more side to its natural beauty that I want to experience before I leave. South of the city, mile upon mile of flat wetlands stretch across the Albufera National Park. The watery landscape has been cultivated into paddy fields, where rice has been grown for centuries and resembles the Far East more than eastern Spain. But it culminates in one of Europe's largest freshwater lagoons. Hola, yo soy Alex. Encantada. Buenas tardes. Gracias. Nowadays, these barcas, long wooden boats, work the lake, showing visitors the magical beauty of the Albufera. It's well worth holding out until sunset to make the trip. When I was told I was coming to Valencia, I did not expect this. I knew nothing about the lagoon. I didn't know about these waterways. I knew nothing about the rice. All I've ever heard about is the beautiful beaches, and it seems to me that the beaches are the least interesting part of this story. I wonder how many of the thousands of holiday makers who come here for the beaches know anything about all this, all this beauty. Not enough, I'm sure. I don't think I've ever been anywhere like this. This, this is completely extraordinary. Next, I'm heading south, where the bright lights of the Costa Blanca await me. Venturing south of Valencia and the White Coast, 120 miles of Mediterranean shoreline snakes its way along eastern Spain. The Costa Blanca is where Britain's love affair with this country is at its most intense. It's the expat's favorite destination. You'll find more British on the Costa Blanca than anywhere else in Europe. And many of them are retirees, seduced by year-round sun and a climate recognized by the World Health Organization as one of the best in the world. I'm sure I could seek out rural villages and discover hidden coves along this coast. But instead, I'm heading to the province of Alicante, where I'm told I'll find the Costa's very own little corner of England. It's no secret that this region is a British enclave, but I'd like to know why. Jerry and Margaret moved to the Spanish mainland 16 years ago. Good afternoon, morning, something. Alex, I'm Jerry Bartley. It's so nice this to This is Margaret, my wife. Nice to Lovely see you here. To meet you. Thank, Thank you so yourself. much. I'm really looking forward to this. They belong to one of Alicante's most successful bowls clubs, where the members are almost exclusively expats. How often are you here in the club? Me? Uh, probably too many times, according to Margaret. <laughs> I tell you, you to bring his bed yet. down. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, no, I'm usually down here about three days a week, I should think. Yeah. yeah. How long does it take you to get good? <laughs> ah, You're still getting there. I'm still there. getting there. <laughs> I am still getting there. Is everyone here retired? Literally everybody. We've just got one couple who still have uh, jobs over here. But other than that, everybody here is retired, living the life, living the dream. Oh. And that's not what I many, mean. Not it's, many people get to say that. It, honestly, 
the quality of life over here for us is so much better. So you have everything you want here. What else do I need? I've got the sunshine. I've got Margaret. I've got a lovely place to live. I've got a fantastic bowls club. We literally don't want for anything else. Is there nothing that you miss yes, about the UK? there is something. Oh, OK. A damn good pint of British beer. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, no, there's absolutely nothing that I would say, God, I'm going to go back to... Good for you. OK. I want to watch a game, really. <laughs> or at least a... What do you call it? It's not an innings. No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 it is. Yeah, it's a game. But Jerry has more in mind for me than simply spectating. I'm venturing dangerously out of my comfort zone. So if I can just show you, the foot has to be on the mat. How do you hold it? You hold it there with the running line with the finger, two on the grips, one around there and the thumb there. All right. And now what I'm going to try and do is see if I can get it on the jack. <laughs> I'm going to be useless at this. I know I am. I just you might get beginner's luck. You know? Yeah, I might. Oh, God, I can't believe I have to publicly do this. It's, yes. just, it's yes. just so mean. Okay. Look, I mean, let's see. Now, now, look. How do I know how hard right. I never okay. tuck one down, right. the bloody you kitchen you said you or whatever it's yeah. called? You'll try, you'll find out. <laughs> OK. <laughs> God, unnatural. There we go. Look at this. Are we following it? Are we following it? Look where it is. It's right on the line. A natural. <laughs> okay, now look, can I just stop there while well, I'm going to be lucky? One more. Oh, no, I'm going to ruin it all now. Oh, perfect. And this is what the game's all about. I feel quite. <laughs> quite emotional. <laughs> I hate being done by an office. <laughs> Begin beginner's luck. Yeah. And a little bit of concentration, breathe in, breathe out. Oh. Oh. That's a good one. No, it's too salt. No, it's not. Right. That's it. Right there. I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken the bowls world by storm and I've surprised myself in the process. Now, there is your closest. Yes. OK. And there is my closest. Oh, my gosh, okay. it's pretty so close. So it's pretty close. So here we go. Here we go down. And... and oh, yes! Half an inch! Half an inch! Half an inch! Half an inch! I am now going home. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing me how to do that. I really enjoyed it. I had to come and experience this to truly understand why so many Brits decide to come and live out their days on the Costa Blanca. Now I get it. I enjoyed myself a lot more than I expected to. This is a really cheery bunch of people who are really enjoying their lives. What more can you ask? Just don't meet enough people who are really sucking the very marrow out of life and you feel like these guys, they're making every minute count. And that's an attitude I completely concur with. But this is the gentler side of life here. I still have to confront its most infamous resort. I'm en route to Benidorm, which is making me a little nervous. Try not to be too snobby about it, but I haven't always heard the best things. Um, and I don't know what kind of experience it's going to provide me. I can't pretend that Benidorm has been on my must-see list of places in the world. But right in the throng of it all, I'm surprised by my first impressions. It seems like a quite civilised, quite family place at the moment to me. There's certainly no rampaging drunken wards. So is Benidorm's dubious reputation really justified? Not according to the millions of Brits who flocked here since the 1970s. Even today, in Europe, only London and Paris see more visitors. Just two hours from the UK, and with package tourism and low-cost airlines making it more accessible than ever, Benidorm's popularity shows no signs of waning. 
this resort's hotels are 90% full even in low season, so it must be doing something right. Benidorm's history fascinates me. Just 60 years ago, barely anyone knew the place even existed. Until 1950, when Pedro Zaragoza Orts became mayor and set about putting the tiny village on the map. Benidorm's iconic and imposing high-rise design was Zaragoza's vision. He wanted to create the ultimate tourist playground and he wanted everyone to have a sea view so he encouraged mass building of skyscrapers. Zaragoza was defiant in his ambitions. In just 15 years, he created beaches from sand dunes, brought in water and electricity, and even managed to get Franco's controversial ban on bikinis lifted. In the 70s, an astonishing 12 million sunseekers flocked the resort, and the rate of development since then has been jaw-dropping. Astonishing. It's impossible not to feel the British influence here, and within the stream of souvenir shops and supermarkets, you'll find Vicky's Salon an expat who moved her whole life to Benidorm 11 years ago. I'm intrigued. Plus, I can't resist a bit of pampering. Okay. That colour, please. Yeah. All right, let's do Gonna it. Gonna go for that one? Let's do it, babes. OK, let's go for it. What is it that has made Benidorm such a draw all these years? There's something in Benidorm for everybody. Um, Benidorm is just not what people think. People only think it's the party, party life, the madness. We get lots of party people, but that's only a tiny, tiny part of Benidorm. The knockers of Benidorm, many of them have never been here at all. Yeah, well, including me. And the ones who, who have a knock it have never ventured out of this very small area of madness. It is Spain. People think this is Little Britain. But people can come here and live a little Britain life. You can, can't they? Yes, and many, many thousands and zillions of people do. My mother-in-law's lived here 30 years and she speaks three words of Spanish. You can do it if you choose to do that. But I think by doing that personally, I think you miss out hugely. I like to go to Spanish bars. I love the atmosphere, the noise, the vibrancy. I really do feel a foreigner in the UK now. Do you? Yeah, I really do. Well, it's... give me some examples. What freaks you out there now? Driving on what to me now is the wrong side of the road, and I never, never thought I'd say that. Eating. We eat so much later here. Oh, it drives me mad, though, that. And it's the whole cultural thing. It is like this kissing people, which to me now is normal. You kiss the bank manager, you kiss everybody, and you find yourself <laughs> doing it in the UK and they look at you as though you are I love the absolutely idea of kissing your bank manager. But, you, but people here just kiss everybody. I just noticed you used the phrase we, then, about something happening here in Spain. Does that mean that you feel more Spanish than English? I, I am English and I'm proud to be English, but this is where I've chosen to live. There are odd British things I, I miss, like uh, yeah. Battenberg cake and things like that. But you are a scream, I don't know, <laughs> but I don't know what the Spanish version is of knighting somebody, <laughs> but they should knight you for services to tourism, I'm telling you that now. If you're going to encourage me to see the real Benidorm, the Benidorm that you're so passionate about and that you talk about so convincingly, <laughs> where would you send me? You need to go down to the far end of the Levante beach to the projectory that sticks out, which is the Mirador, and that is absolutely heaven. It's what n Nobody believes Benidorm exists like that. OK. So do it. I'll do that then. You are commander. Listen, I always know an expert when I hear one. I'm going to do, <laughs> I'm going to do what, she, what she says. <laughs> Perfect. Look at my lovely nails. Thank They're you beautiful. Very much, both of you. Okay. No problem. Okay. People speak with such fondness for Benidorm, and I think I understand why now. I've not spent long here, but already I can see that the brochures and the TV only tell you part of Benidorm's vibrant story. You have to experience it for yourself. So I'm standing at the Mirador. 
and Benidorm has really surprised me. It's not at all what I was expecting. I think it's become lazy shorthand for everything that's bad about a package holiday. And that has just not been my experience. It's so stupid of me to make a judgment about somewhere I've never been before. But I know better now. Look at this lovely sea. Look at the endless beaches I've seen. And yes, there are plenty of madding crowds, but there is so much more than that here. And you're never far from a true, authentic Spanish experience, as I'm about to discover. When you found yourself fatigued by Benidorm, it's easy to escape and discover a complete antidote. I do love a little boat trip. I'm retreating, not far, but somewhere that feels a world away. Just a few miles off the incredibly populated Costa Blanca, away from the madness of Benedict, is the tiny island of Havarca, which I believe is the smallest inhabited island in Spain. At just two kilometers long, Tabarca is an unspoilt fishing village, its rocky shores peppered with coves. Apparently, the pristine waters here offer an unmissable snorkeling experience. By day, the island can still feel very touristy, as boats bring day-trippers keen to spend an hour or two off the mainland. To get the true character of the place, you have to time it just right. The secret here is to stay the night. There's very few beds here. Tourists all have to leave on the last boat. And then it feels as if I'm going to have the place to myself. But you have to work fast to snap up a room in the handful of B&Bs, typically an old fisherman's cottage like this one. Isn't this lovely? Isn't this a lovely little room? Very simple. Just what you'd hope for, really, somewhere like this. With no noisy bars or cars, it feels as though the modern world has forgotten about this place. There's literally not another soul to be seen. It's completely deserted. Much needed balm to the soul. Less than 50 people inhabit this bijou island. Hola. Hola, buenas tardes, son Alex. Matthias, an artist, has been resident since 1973 after visiting on a voyage of discovery. He llegado con una pareja de colonia en un velero. He visto esa imagen. Sí. Hemos dicho aquí mañana vamos a ir con el barco para ver esta isla. Hemos encontrado aquí una isla totalmente abandonado de, de cultura de de la civilización más o menos, era muy atrasado, y sin dinero en, la, en el bolso, sí. <laughs> hemos pensado, compramos también una casa. Were there a lot of people living here at the time? Sí, empezó, empezó en los años 80. In the 80s. El, el movimiento aquí. There were more people. There were, there, sí. were there schools here? Turistas, turistas, ¿no? Tourists. But while the arrival of tourists in Benidorm completely changed its identity, life here was still primitive, with no water or electricity until the mid-80s. And today, although the island sees more visitors, it still feels very authentic. He still loves the island, and the beauties of nature are still here. It is still as beautiful as ever. Obviously, sometimes the numbers of people become rather overwhelming nowadays. So is, <laughs> so is it. <laughs> so it is. I don't think this is the life for me, but to spend a day or so here is a pleasure I'd thoroughly recommend. This feels like a million miles away from Benidorm. You can't even believe it's in the same country. <laughs> I wish I was here with my husband, my one true love, wandering the streets romantically hand in hand. To cater for the growing numbers of tourists, more restaurants have sprung up on Tabarca. But I want to eat like a local, so Matthias has given me a tip-off about where they all go. At El Rincón de Ramos, 
Carmen has been cooking the island's signature dish for over 40 years. I'm about to try a speciality of tabarca, which is a caldero di gallina. Gallina is a type of fish, it's a rock fish that's abundant around here. I've never had one before. I'm really looking forward to it. This so-called fish stew is flavoured with a distinctive sweet pepper paste. <laughs> but this isn't exactly what I expected. You've really got to work for it. It's a very bony rockfish. I mean, look at this, all bone and no meat. Hardly worth the effort, I would suggest. <laughs> very tasty, though. Delicious. Mm. This is a peasant dish. None the worse for it. But we're used to slightly richer fare these days, aren't we? Still, when in Tabarca, you know what they do. Everywhere I've been on this leg of my journey has surprised me. And this little gem in the shadow of the neon lights of Benidorm is no exception. Costa Blanca is 200 kilometers of some of the busiest coastline on the Mediterranean. And this is a complete contrast and it's just a few kilometers away. Beggar's belief that somewhere like this still exists. I'm glad I've come here to see it for myself. I'm leaving the Costa Blanca feeling very different to how I thought I would. What I found in this small stretch of Spain has really surprised me. I found beaches, culture, solitude and madness. It's all here. I'm definitely coming back to this part of the world. I'm longing to find out what other forgotten corners there are. Next time, I reach southern Spain, where I'll experience the wild and diverse region of Andalusia. I'm granted exclusive access to the majestic Alhambra. Just to see it without the crowds, this is luxury beyond compare. And I'll meet the king of one of Spain's most celebrated arts.